welcoming you to a life of awareness. The Presence Projects is excited for you to join us for today's podcast with your host, Paul Kersner. Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Are You Being Present? My name is Paul Kersner. I want to welcome you to the present moment. I want to welcome you to the here and now. And I want to thank you wholeheartedly, sincerely, and deeply for joining me in this amazing present moment. The title and topic of this podcast is Doing Nothing with Presence. And I am joined by guest host Andrew Marshall. Andrew is an author, he is a blogger, and he also has a bunch of really great tweets on Twitter. He wrote The Art of Not Doing, he wrote Awakening Heart, and also wrote The Great Little Book of Happiness. I caught Andrew on Twitter. I reached out to him. We chatted for a little bit, and we were able to set up a time to do this podcast. He actually lives in England, so this would be our first podcast that was filmed internationally, which is very special. So without any further introductions... I would like to present podcast number 34 with Andrew Marshall. So, Andrew, I want to thank you for joining me. And I've been following you on on Twitter. And uh, I've definitely resonated with a few of your tweets. And I've looked through your website. And I definitely need to pick up one of your books. I mean, I've read through a couple of your blog posts. But yeah. just the title of The Art of Not Doing uh, really struck me because uh, I talk a lot about presence to my audience as well as to my patients and to my clients. And I find that we live, at least here in the States, where people like to be doing something all the time. Yes. And that is a extreme detractor from presence because it's... You know, people are just trying to fill their time. They're trying to numb themselves out. It's a distraction. And they do it from the moment that they wake up till the moment that they go to bed. And Mm. I found that, you know, doing nothing, especially with the intention of being present, is a practice by itself. And I'm quite curious and I would love to learn a little bit more about how you came up with that title, maybe a little bit more about that book, even if you want to just share a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, well, I started meditation uh, back in uh, 1978, and uh, I've been practicing every day since then. And I suppose that gave me a certain degree of calmness throughout my working life. And uh, probably about 12, 13 years ago, I started uh, learning Tai Chi and Qigong. And I found that the stillness that I was getting in meditation was essential for the Tai Chi practice. And I've been doing various things with healing, uh, using energy and kinesiology. And then the idea came to write because I'd been doing or leading workshops. It's just very small and locally. And after a while, the thought struck well, if people are responding well to this, why don't I write about it? And uh, that's how it started with my first book and um, then gradually it developed and The Art of Not Doing was my third. And the, I think the driving force behind that was just the um, amazing thing about consciousness and being still. And I must say that in the last 10 years or more, um, now I'm saying 10 years, I think it's probably more like 15 or so, I've been very, very influenced by uh, initially Thich Nhat Hanh, um, his writings and some of his audio work as well. And it just struck me that when I look round, you may go to a restaurant for a meal and nobody's enjoying their food really. They're looking at the menu to see what's coming next. (laughs) And that's where it started, I guess, The Art of Not Doing. And I was also influenced by a a book by Thich Nhat Hanh, which was a commentary. I can't remember the name now, but it was on a Chinese text. And 
that was very much about not doing and it just suddenly the penny dropped you don't need to be doing all the time and if you relax enough and allow your awareness to expand enough then you can even be not doing while you're doing which may mm. sound odd but it, it's that it's just having that stillness which gradually expands so that's how it started and i wanted to get something of that across mm. you know you, you touched you touched upon quite a few things that we can jump right into uh, and i think before we do let's talk a little bit about not doing because I mean, literally, if if you were to tell someone that, they'd think, "Oh, I I just need to sit still and not think, not move, not talk." Mm. I think there's a lot of variability when it comes to not doing. You know, meditation is probably the best example, but of course, meditation isn't for everyone, especially in the beginning, mm-hmm. when you know when you're just starting out and you have a very busy mind and you can barely sit still for a minute or two. I think even just having the observation that you're always having to do something is the beginning of moving towards slowing down and and, and trying to conceptualize what not doing actually represents because it's become, it's definitely become an epidemic where we feel like we're not achieving if we're not doing. I read um, about a year ago or so about a test that had been conducted in a laboratory to try and get people to sit doing nothing for 15 minutes. And there was an alternative that they could do was to amuse themselves if they wanted. They could give themselves an electric shock. Mm. And nobody could sit still for 15 minutes. They would rather give themselves an electric shock (laughs) because Mm. they just couldn't do it. Extraordinary, isn't it? But that's how we are. Well, it makes sense since there's so much stimulus constantly going on you know, from, from, from the point of awakening to the point of going to sleep. You know, we have all these different things that we, we can and often do pay attention to that are all external, all part of our external environment, which for a lot of people is, is a lot um, more pleasant than peering in internally if you haven't done a lot of interplane work. Yes. Um. So, you know, so to you... And I think this would this is an interesting thing to kind of delve into as well. Where do we start when we we start to consider um, the art of not doing? What, what's the beginning stages for someone who constantly is thinking, constantly needs to be doing something, talking to someone? Where, where do we begin? There are two possibilities, I think. One is, first of all, to have the awareness that that's what's going on. And most people don't have that awareness. Uh, They get trapped into uh, the mind and the way it's leading and the way the thoughts are going and never become the observer. And if only for a few seconds we can just be aware of the energy of the mind that's moving towards wanting to do this or wanting to do that, that, that's a good start. Mm. Another is simply um, just breathe, just sit and or stand or walk even, but just be aware of the breath, but don't do it for too long. Three, four, five breaths, that's enough, then carry on. And if mm. we start to habituate just a little bit um, of just feeling something and feeling what's going on in the body, as we get these impulses to grab our phone, to check if we've got any messages, that sort of thing. Gradually, it can come. and It's just a little, little bit at a time. I think part of the problem that we have in approaching it is the desire for instant fulfilment. Mm. When I've given introductory talks on meditation, a lot of people think I'm going to give them something, some magic capsule that instantly uh, brings them uh, continuing peace and of course it doesn't happen you have to work at it but we're so used these days yeah okay i want something i'll order it from amazon it's here tomorrow great doesn't work like that with ourselves no no it doesn't you know and i talk um a lot about presence and presence having to be earned 
It's certainly not something that could be purchased or given. No. It's something that we have to to work at a, at a daily base on a daily basis, you know. And I talk a lot about mindfulness practices and the intention that you you start your day with. You know, of course, being the observer of your thoughts is is a is an amazing exercise. And it could also be a terrifying yes. one because once we start really observing the thoughts that we're having and we're starting to see them and, and, and we're detracting from our ego's ability to dominate ourselves, that's when the real work begins. You know, that's yes, when indeed. that's when the rubber hits the road where you're yeah. you're where you really to start to see that, you know, you, you've been this victim of your thought process. And and really like what it's going to take to to stop that cycle. Now, being an observer, it's easy to say, well, what does that mean to to be an observer uh, of my thoughts? And really, to me, when when I talk about being an observer, you know, and one of the practices that that I use is to kind of visualize your thoughts as clouds in the sky um, and not to become overly uh, attached to them or associated to them, but kind of allowing them to pass and you know yes. taking taking note of them but but with with an observer's eye not with uh, someone who's being conditioned by those thoughts yes yes you know and breathwork too breathwork is a tremendous presence tool uh you know and you're saying just take a couple breaths that's fine even one deep breath has the ability to shift us out of um, our our ego dominated thought stream yes and to enjoy it yeah. As well, I think this is absolutely uh, essential that we we are experts at avoiding everything, mm -hmm. avoiding ourselves in particular, avoiding the feelings, avoiding the discomfort. But if we can just learn to enjoy feeling that flow of breath through the nostrils, going down the passage, and just feeling perhaps it expanding almost into the belly and out again and as we breathe out just let it everything just relax almost a sigh comes and it's great and you can enjoy that but we don't enjoy it but we can enjoy this is a, i'm sure the work that you do has a lot to do with this that it's enjoying coming presence is enjoyment as soon as you are present life is amazing mm. isn't it you know, it's interesting you talk about that as well, because to me, it's more about acceptance. Yeah, you know, I absolutely agree. You know, enjoyment is great, but acceptance needs to take precedence because there's going to be a lot of moments that, that don't necessarily feel good. And I was, I was thinking the other day about how important it is to be uncomfortable at times. Oh, but, yes. You yes. know, you talk about avoidance. It's like we've built a whole society around not around feeling good and not being uncomfortable and yes. how does any growth take place if we're if we're not put into situations where it does you know where we have to like persevere through a certain level of discomfort i mean to me that's where true growth takes place yeah i, I remember many years ago going on a workshop and someone described this as sweet pain I don't know if that uh, resonates with you at all, but in other words, it's it's painful feeling the discomfort, but at the same time, something really good about it, this hint of sweetness, because mm. by feeling that pain, something is actually being released. It's moving us from one stage to another. Well, it's also important to understand that when a certain level of discomfort takes place, uh, you know, everything's constantly changing anyway. You know, and yeah. that might be a good point to implement the art of not doing when, when the discomfort arises, because then you can sit with it and see it for what it is instead of trying to avoid it or numb it yes. out or run away from it. Yes. But again, like, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, are stuck in fight or flight mode where they're hyper responsive to, to certain stimulus, certain stimuli. And as soon as a certain level of discomfort arises... You know, it's like almost like a knee jerk reaction to shut that down. But when you shut it down, you're actually denying yourself of a, of a learning opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, meditation yeah. is, is uh, again, you know, and I, my practice, I, I tend to 
wax and wane with, with my meditation practice. And, um, I need to be a little bit more consistent with it because that's also a practice that builds upon itself. But that really gives you a, a, a real uh, ability to not be as responsive because it just has a very calming effect on the nervous system. And if we're, if we're preaching um, non-responsiveness and, and the person finds that, you know, they're hypervigilant, well, the best medicine that they could take is, is not psychotropic medication or alcohol or anything. It's, it's really a uh, meditation so that mm. you can start settling your nervous system down. Yeah. It, sometimes it strikes me. It's a little bit like, um, when we get into being with ourselves, it's a bit like when you've perhaps done a lot of shopping or you've been on a long walk or you've just done something that was difficult and you sit down and you go, Oh, it's good to sit down. And there's an instant as you have that, oh, it's good to sit down. We're well, actually with yourself and not avoiding something. But then, mm-hmm. of course, what do we do? We pick up a magazine or we do this or we do that or we feel guilty. As my wife would say, she says, I can't sit and do nothing. Your books are all very fine. I can't sit and do nothing because <laughs> I feel guilty about it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's the way we're conditioned, isn't it? But you're... Ab- I mean, bang on the nail, it's accepting. And if we're uncomfortable, accept we're uncomfortable. Mm. And Mm. that enables uh, some energy to be released from whatever's causing that discomfort, I think. Well, of course, the the acceptance allows for change. Yes. Because... The more you hold on to something or the more you resist it, the closer you bring it, bring it in, the more hyper focused you become on whatever it is that's that you don't like. And again, when we place a lot of attention on things that we don't like, we tend to get more of that. Yes. And, I, I, you know, in meditation and, and not doing allows for acceptance, but it allows for change, it allows for growth. Uh, you know, and you wrote another book, the great little book of happiness. Yes. You know, and uh, happiness is is definitely an interest. In, it's a very interesting topic these days because there's a tremendous amount of subjectivity to what happiness is. It's different, yes, indeed. you know, different for everyone. But a title like the great little book of happiness, and a t- and I'm I'm interested to 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 learn a little bit more about you know. That, that book specifically and your perceptions on happiness and how that has to do with the art of not doing and presence. In one sense, I feel that whatever I write, whatever workshop I lead, I'm always saying the same thing, just in a different way. And the uh, great little book of happiness, I suppose it's influenced to a certain extent, by um, Buddhist thought and, and application. But it was also from experience. And the trouble is, once you put a label on on something, saying, well, it comes from this field or it comes from that, is that, ah, oh, it's labelled, ah, oh, well, that's not for me. So what I wanted to do was to present uh, sort of basic mechanics, I suppose, in a way of how we react and how we see things in a way that's okay for anybody. It doesn't mm. matter what your background. Yeah, there are certain things, and the whole business of presence comes into it. It's all the way through. And what I tried to do with the great little book of happiness was, was I suppose, put in things that I've been talking about o- over the years. And... It wasn't just about mindfulness, but that comes into it. It's about love, but not just about love. It's about compassion, but not just about compassion. It's about looking at things more deeply, but it's not just about that. It's all these things. It's about living within natural cycles, being aware of the different cycles within ourselves, within our environment, and so on. And all these things, they're just little pieces, parts of the jigsaw. And... A lot of people who've uh, given me feedback on that book say, do you know, I bought that several years ago, but I still dip into it. Mm. Um, 
and I've always said to people, don't try and read it all the way through if you don't want to. Just pick little bits up. Mm. And and I think that's that's right about anything. I don't know if you uh, read many books, Paul, but certainly I'll uh, try to read some, but often I'll pick up a book that I read years ago. Did I really read this? I don't remember that bit. Ah, that's so much clearer now, that sort of thing. And so perhaps in your in your uh, in your podcasts here it's what as i see it you're you're taking things from a slightly different angle each time uh, i may be wrong because i haven't listened to them all i'm very sorry but i no, will okay. i'll try no. and catch up with you <laughs> but uh, but, <laughs> but it's 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 looking at things from a just a little bit looking at your garden from the bottom of the garden rather than the top of the garden mm. and other things look different and yeah. suddenly it just wakes the mind up a bit. Ah, yes. Yeah, yes. you know, it, it's 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 like um, offering different facets and different aspects revolving around the same thing. And, yeah. you know, and, and over the past 33 podcasts, I've touched upon all different aspects of presence. I've had different uh, guest hosts on because it's important to provide many different flavors because, you, you know, one piece of information is not going to be applicable for everyone just like yeah. happiness doesn't mm. mean the same thing for everyone and it's interesting that you talk about you know having different uh not necessarily calling it like a buddhist perspective or this or that so that you don't get trapped into a, a label because once you get trapped into a label of course the ego kicks in and you know all the associations along with that label the things that a person likes or doesn't like and can immediately discount or, Yes. Um, you know, that, that, that happens. And that's a very normal, humanistic, egoic way of interpreting the world and interpreting information. And it's important for us to provide a wide, um, offering, you know, because, it, you know, like you're saying, bits and pieces are going to, are going to pop out, especially, and it's nice to, to go through a book that you've read years ago and, and just open up to a specific page and, and read something that kind of resonates with you in that moment. Yes. You know, I, I do that. I do that often. And I do that with my podcasts as well. You know, I'll re-listen to uh, an old one and be like, Oh, that's interesting. I don't remember talking about that. And then it kind of like brings something forward into my consciousness. Yeah. A uh, uh, couple of months ago, we were digging out um, some old papers uh which had been stored up. And when we opened all the folders, there were old course notes. Because when I run a course or workshop, I've always got copies of my notes there. And I was reading through them. Thought, Did we really do this? <laughs> uh, so, yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's great to go back sometimes just to revisit. Mm, mm, mm. You wrote another book called Awakening Heart. Yes. That that's yeah. almost my favourite. Not I think the art of not doing is my favourite, really. But uh, awakening heart, um, the blissful path to self realisation was the subtitle. But there I wanted to sort of tackle the the odd subject of of love, which people again tend to avoid, and so I wanted to cut through um, a lot of the misconceptions about love. So it, a lot of people think love, well, that's either soppy or it's romantic, and that's not what things are about. And yet if we say that it's, um, oh, yes, because I've, I've met people say, oh, yes, 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 I, I love everyone in the world. Well, that's utter rubbish. <laughs> uh, you, may, you may think you do as a principle, fine, yes, but when they come up to you, you think, hmm, did I? No. And the truth of the fact is, I think, that most of us have a huge area of indifference, and that's what the book was there to, Awakening Heart, open up the heart centre, uh, start to feel things more, uh, start to bring a little bit of passion into it. And I talked in that book about love in business, love in the health services, love in commerce, and that, that sort of thing. And yeah, I, 
I felt myself um, when I was writing that sort of getting, oh, yes, <laughs> uh, because in, in our uh, in the UK, we've got a lot of pressure on the health service and it's underfunded. We, we have a national health service here and um, people are always criticising or were at the time I was writing that, was criticising the health service because there are either delays or misdiagnoses and, and that sort of thing. And I thought, well, I want to turn that around a bit. So there's a section there on we should be compassionate towards those who care for us. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I enjoyed that book. Mm. Enjoyed that. So love and presence, huh? Mm. Love has the ability to quickly pull us out of the present moment because a lot of times it's uh, something, you know, that happened in the past or something that might happen in the future. I think it, it takes work to really keep love um, in the present moment. Uh, and, you know, that's a practice by itself. But, you know, love, again, is, is like happiness. There's such a, an extreme amount of subjectivity to a topic like that. So it's interesting that you would present it in a way that to, to help people at least give them a reflection point that it's more advantageous to show love and appreciation to um to something that most people would take for granted uh especially in a, if medicine was socialized where everyone just expected that's a part of life and it's a service that's provided for them you know here in the states it's not the same um, maybe one day it can be but you know i i'd also imagine that healthcare workers in the in in america um also um aren't as appreciated or valued as they should be. Mm. Yeah, the same thing yeah. for teachers. Well, it, it, in that book, Awakening Hearts, I, I used a phrase, magnificent wholeness. And to me, the both presence and love. The, because if you are fully present, you can't help but love. And... Uh, once you start to feel that, once you have presence, then you start to, uh, I say, make contact with, it's always there, but you're more aware, I should say, perhaps, of what I like to call magnificent wholeness. There's, uh, because uh, you and I are on uh, thousands of miles apart physically, but here we are, we could be in the same room. Um, but we see things as... Uh, objects don't we we say well that's out there i'm here and with presence with awakening the heart with allowing love to develop not forcing it just allowing it to develop then we can start to feel that we're not just one part of a whole but actually we are that whole yeah it's the ego that wants to rem that wants to keep reminding us that we're separate you know that it totally wants does. to to um build walls between us um and and walls? you and... don't have walls in the united states do you <laughs> <laughs> that's for a whole different podcast <laughs> but there's so much divisiveness in 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 the world today and i think in in one way uh, consciousness of humanity is uh, rising at an extraordinary rate but at the same time, like when you turn the light on, the shadows get darker. Um, it, it sort of stirs a lot of the dross. So we've got a lot of this divisiveness, which um, is unfortunate, but I guess it's part of the healing process, I think, overall. Uh, the, what we have to be careful of, I, I think, is not to allow ourselves to get swept up in that because it's as though the mind, which can be accepting and open, suddenly and as you say the ego it screws down into uh, negativity it's so easy to be negative isn't it mm -hmm. and uh, it, in the delightful weather we've had today most people in the uk not everybody but most of them say what a miserable day well of course that's rubbish the day can't be miserable 
Only you can be miserable, and you've decided to be miserable because of the weather. <laughs> but uh, but that it, it's so easy. And if you're not careful, you say, oh, yes, it is, isn't it? Oh, it's dreadful, isn't it? Well, that comes down to perception and reality, you know? Yeah, absolutely, the, yes. The way you see things is the way that they are. But, you know, if if you have a meditative practice and you're really working, working on awakening your heart and you're working on happiness, you you don't always have to jump towards labels because, you know, a rainy day is just a rainy day. It doesn't have to be necessarily associated with any different kinds of emotions. I think people just accept those and and run with it, but you can have an amazing day on a rainy day and you can have a miserable day on a beautiful, you can have a miserable day when it's sunny and bright. Absolutely. Yes. You know, it's just that, you know, Again, the mind loves to draw these connections. And, and we're conditioned. We're conditioned and we have these neural yeah. pathways and it becomes normal. And then, then it becomes accepted yeah. because, you know, one person talks to another person, another person talks to another person. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people are having a miserable day. Yes. Yeah. It's so, what some once uh, I heard um, many years ago when I first learned to meditate, um, those who are teaching me that the bus conductor syndrome uh, over here, a bus conductor isn't the driver of the vehicle, but um, you don't have them very much these days because you pay when you go on or you have a but in the old days. You'd have a bus conductor who'd uh, walk through the bus and hand out tickets as people paid him. And they said, if the bus conductor on the way to work is whistling and smiling and happy and joking, Everybody gets off the bus happy, but if he's a miserable devil, everybody goes into work being miserable, and then it spreads. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's good. Isn't that isn't that interesting though that the human condition that that um, feelings and emotions can can be transferred? Yeah, you know, like like a virus. All the more reason for 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 being present, and and, and really, you know, observing your your thoughts and your emotions yeah um not for the idea that you're worried someone else might pick up your thoughts or your emotions but that so that there's a boundary there between you and your thoughts and your and your feeling space and between you and other people's thoughts and feeling spaces um you know and that's easier said than done but when you're really focused and building your practice whether you're doing qigong or tai chi or meditation or journaling or even just listening to a podcast on presence you know it's it's the effort it's the time that you put in it's you know are you earning it and because again like, and like you talked about before you know meditative practice or presence is not something that can be purchased i mean I wish it. I wish it could, because it'd make it a lot easier. But it, it's um, it's a process that needs to be earned on a moment-to-moment basis. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So conversationally circling, I'd love to to just get back to what the topic that we started on, which is the art of not doing. Um. And I just want to kind of delve a little bit deeper into it because I think that, you know, at least having you on the podcast, we can talk a little bit further and give some people some examples um, aside from meditation uh, of what not doing might look like. Because, you know, if, if life is so busy that you barely have time to sit that your schedule is is so packed that your phone is always ringing. You're always getting text messages. Where do we go from there? How how do we break the cycle? Like what, what are the first steps? And clearly the first steps are at least being observant that you, that you are stuck into a cycle of doing. Yeah. And also I think a couple of tips uh, that I found helpful over the years is slow down. Uh, because uh, we often walk quickly from one thing to another and we're not aware of the fact that we're walking on carpet or on wood or on stone or grass. We're just getting from one place to another. So slowing down is a, a very real thing that we can do. And pausing and just learning to stop 
going from one place to another, just stop. Yeah. That's you know, it. You, just yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting you talk about that because like how often do we, you know, take our shoes off and, and feel the grass or yeah. or even feel the tile floor underneath our feet? Or I mean it, it we just and I say we, I mean it's it's me too, like it's everyone. We just take things for granted. We 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 forget to really smell the roses and it's so important because like th- those moments those are presence moments those are those are moments to help pull you into the present moment when you're you're really admiring something the way it smells the way it looks the way it feels like that's an amazing presence tool and that is a, a, a definitely a part of of not doing or at least making your way towards that is really enjoying making the most of, of, of those moments. And there's countless opportunities throughout your day. Even if you're just washing your hands to feel like the water on your hands, like yeah. how amazing does that feel? But you know, we do it tons of times during the day. We don't even think twice about it. Yeah. Because we're thinking of the next thing, usually yep. the next thing that we've got to do. And I said to a group the other day, um, it's one, one of my Tai Chi classes. I said, even doing the washing up. Uh, sorry, over here, washing up is doing the dishes. And so I say, doing the dishes. I said, even doing the dishes, um, that can be enjoyable. And I had some really strange looks, especially from the men. And I said, you have the choice. You can either enjoy that moment, just feel what you're doing, feel the hot water, feel the... Uh, whatever it is you're washing up where it's a cup or whatever the glass and don't think about gosh am i going to be watching the television program in a moment no just concentrate on that slow down and as we slow down we lose tension We, we, we gradually we relax because my experience has been that uh, tension in the body arises in the mind, not in the body. Unless there's been a physical injury, which is different, but uh, tension always arises in the mind. So if we can just learn, stop, take a breath, carry on. Mm. Then stop, take a breath, feel what we're doing, carry on. Appreciate where we're walking, carry on. And I think some people are put off by it by thinking you've got to do the whole lot in one go in other words you've got to be mindful for 24 hours no it's better to start if you can do it for a few seconds that's great Hmm. a few seconds several times a day it's great and maybe the next day it may build up a little bit maybe a little less doesn't matter and just keep doing that stop Learn to stop. And in the art, the book, The Art of Not Doing, uh, there's a whole chapter on karma, law of cause and effect, but particularly in terms of mental karma. Every thought that we have is caused by a preceding thought or a feeling. And by learning to stop, just have a pause, it's like hitting the pause button, then carry on. It just interrupts that flow because otherwise we've got an endless cycle of thoughts. It doesn't stop. And I find that if we can stop, it's a bit like if you're watching a movie on the television, maybe. uh, You can get so wound up into it and you might even be wanting to go to the loo and your legs are going to be your legs crossed. But no, gosh, I can't miss this next bit. And you get so wound up into it. But if you hit the pause button. Oh. I'm back in the room <laughs> and that's what we're not we're we're not back in the room but if we can train ourselves to be back in the room just a little bit at a time mm. gradually we start to think I felt better when I stopped yeah. and that's the next stage I think I felt better when I stopped I don't feel as good when I'm not paying attention when I'm not aware when I'm not being present mm. mental karma huh it's the first time I've heard that term it's an interesting yeah. term indeed. Well, the law of cause and effect, I mean, if we accept, well, if we start to do a little analysis, we'll 
well, you can't but accept that there is a law of cause and effect. In other words, every effect has a preceding cause. Uh, it may be earlier on, or it may be more recent, doesn't matter. But um, the way we think uh, affects the way we think next. Mm. And so uh, two things with mental karma. One is that you can say, well, okay, positive thoughts are we know that positive thoughts are much better than negative thoughts, but a negative thought will create another negative thought and vice versa. But there's also the aspect of um, breaking the uh, that endless chain, just putting little pauses into it, because then that will also slow things down and enable us to be more present and then to enjoy life more. That's what I found, anyhow. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And you know, I've, I've definitely looked into and spoken of uh, the law of cause and effect, which we cannot escape in this lifetime. It's, it's just interesting for you to introduce um, thoughts into the law of cause and effect, mm -hmm. which makes a whole lot of sense. So it's only a, a question of how to break that cycle. Uh, especially if someone is trapped in a cycle of, of negative thoughts or troubling thoughts, the first step and the best way to do it is definitely through meditation, but at least just becoming the observer gives you that opportunity to break that uh, thought process. Yeah. And we also need to accept, I think that we're not particularly good at this and it's okay if we have those moments, days maybe, weeks maybe, where we're not present, where we're not aware, and then suddenly we'll have that little wake-up call, ah, oh, yes, and I'll come back. If we can accept that, I think it it's, makes it more doable, or not doable. Um, it, we just need to um, keep coming back, keep coming back. Coming back to Thich Nhat Hanh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he says so often, even I have to work at it. <laughs> and a lot of people regard him as perhaps one of the leading uh, authorities on mindfulness. Uh, but he says, even I have to work at it, because it's the habitual tendency of the mind. <clears throat> excuse me. It's the habitual tendency of the mind to keep going around and around. And you have to keep coming back to these periods of clarity. Of course, I mean, not, not being present is as important as being present because it's all relativistic. Yes. You, know, you can't know one but, without the other. No. And being aware that you've not been present is great as well. That's, that's part of it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, all, it's just reference points, really. You know, it, the 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 goal and the work has to be always towards you know working your way back to the moment but there's going to be so many times throughout the day throughout life where it, it's there's just so much distraction that you know you you become um you get sucked out of the moment and whether that's for a few moments or days or whatever you mm. know it's that aha moment where you get snapped back in that that makes it all the more worthwhile yes so andrew i want to i definitely want to thank you for for spending time today and chatting with me um I, it's been definitely i've I found it i've enjoyed it and i've learned a lot new couple new terms i'm gonna I'm gonna start looking into and i might start using with your permission of um, <laughs> but yes. i just no. Go on. I was going to say, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, I feel very privileged that you've actually asked me to uh, connect and it's no, it's it's great and it's so important. Yeah, you know, it's it's important that there are people out there that are teaching, you know, different aspects of presence, you know, to different audiences in different ways, in different mediums, you yes. know, because there's going to be people who love listening to podcasts and there's going to be people who love reading books. Yeah which means that I need to write a book as well, but um, <laughs> that's for a whole nother time. So Andrew, if people are looking to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Uh, the best way is 
through my website, uh, zendiarist.com, at Z-E-N-D-I-A-R-I-S-T.com. And there is my blog there, a little bit of information, not too much, um, and also a link to the books that you've referred to kindly. Perfect. You could also find uh, Andrew on Twitter. His Twitter name is... Uh, Brushbird's Tail. It's oh, at Bar- <laughs> yeah. Brushbird's Tail <laughs> or Zendarist. Yeah. So, Andrew, thank you again for joining us. I want to thank everyone for listening, and I want to welcome everyone back to the present moment. Thank you for listening to the Are You Being Present podcast, brought to you by The Presence Projects. Remember, you have a choice. Choose to be present.